um, to hear our guest speaker who has come to our campus. And I've, I have continued to say, um, Dr. Augustine reached out to me and was really wanting to come um, to Mars Hill. And as we have spoken over the months and even today, he doesn't want this just to be a one-time occasion. So this is someone that is interested in us as an institution and interested in you as an individual. So please keep that in mind as you think about the message that he's going to bring to us really in a time that we're all trying to figure out how do we get along and be a stronger community. Dr. Augustine is a senior pastor at St. Joseph's AME Church in Durham, which when I was in high school and college was actually my home church. Um, he wasn't the senior pastor then, but again, you never know when um, your roads are going to intersect. But in, in addition to being the senior pastor at St. Joseph, he also serves as a member of the faculty at North Carolina Central um, University. And he also works as a mission strategist for Duke University's Center for Reconciliation. He's also the national chaplain for the Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated. It is the first um, African-American fraternity at the intercollegiate level. I guess um, all things divulge my family are alphas. I'm not an alpha, but my father, my uncle, my brother, my cousin, they're alphas. So they're excited that an alpha man is here on campus this evening. Dr. Augustine also received a Lifetime Achievement Award from President Barack Obama, and he's also the National Bar Association's 40 Lawyers Under 40 Award winner, and Ebony Magazine's 30 Leaders of the Future. He's been recognized as one. So I bring to you Dr. J. Augustine. What a pleasure, what a joy to be in this space, in this place, at this time. I want to lift up and say thank you to Mr. Jonathan McCoy for being a professional and being courteous. I am respectful of his duties as a professor as well as as a diversity, equity, and inclusion professional. And again, I am deeply thankful to be in this space, in this place, with this beautiful, beautiful campus. Did I say beautiful? Beautiful campus at this time. I also want to give special deference to this university's leadership. I am deeply grateful for the opportunity now to have personally met President uh, Tony Floyd, a fellow lawyer. I am thankful for the Mars Hill tradition that he carries on, and I also want to lift up who is traditionally one of the unsung heroes of a university campus, and that is the provost, Dr. Tracy Parkinson. Uh, now, inasmuch as I am an academic, I am also an ordained minister. So please allow me to take the liberty of lifting up this university's, shall I say, CSO, the Chief Spiritual Officer, Reverend Stephanie McCleskey. It is a pleasure, a pleasure. Thank you for your warm welcome. Absolutely. It is a pleasure to be with you. Call it the preacher in me, perhaps, but I want to give you a tagline, sort of a subject that I want to focus on. And that subject matter, which I hope will become clear in just a few moments, is serving gumbo in our neighborhood. Serving gumbo in our neighborhood. Now it's not lost on me that I've been invited to share with you and to discuss diversity at a time when there is a loud contingent of Americans who want to make our country less diverse. In other words, the old expression is often shared that variety is the spice of life. Some people are very vocal in these United States of America, or some may call them the divided states of America, that don't want either variety or spice. They instead want America to be something that is marked by uniformity and blandness. Let me go in reverse order to give you an example of what I mean. The time period in September through October is often celebrated as Hispanic Heritage Month here in America. The time period of March is often celebrated as Women's History Month here in America and the month of February. Why I'm so happy to be in this space and this place at this time is lifted up as Black History Month in America. But this February 
is a little different from last February, and it's different for the February before that. It's different because, regrettably, there is a loud contingent in and around America that want to eliminate the story of black history. They want people to jump from 1607 with the founding of the 13 colonies and sing a chorus of Yankee Doodle Dandy while going all the way to July the 4th, 1776, omitting any reference whatsoever to 1619, the year black history really began here in the United States. Let me share with you a little news flash. You can't talk about American history without talking about black history because black history is a fundamental part of American history. Any attempt to do otherwise undermines variety and waters down spices. Now let me share with you a true story that goes to the context of my remarks. I grew up in New Orleans, and I am a card-carrying member of the Who That Nation. <laughs> Meaning, I don't care that the Rams won the Super Bowl. I am a loyal Saints fan, and I'm a Who Datter for life. So when my friends in Riley Durham ask me if I'm going to go to the Carolina Panthers game, you know what I say? You better stop cursing at me. I'm proud to be from New Orleans. I was a native of New Orleans. My favorite food on the planet, let me be clear, is gumbo. In yesteryear, we would often refer to America as the great melting pot. I don't know if America ever actually bought into that analogy, but as I would say in an authentic New Orleans accent, I sure do love me some gumbo. Now, the melting pot of yesteryear inherently spoke to a narrative of assimilation. It inherently spoke to melting down the authenticity of who you are in order to fit in or in order to belong. There certainly is nothing wrong with cultural identifiers like Mexican American or cultural identifiers like Irish American or cultural identifiers like Italian American. And with a nod to February, there's nothing wrong with the cultural identifier of African American. But I'm suggesting that the concept of a melting pot does not speak to the type of individuality and authenticity we want to be a part of a conversation about diversity here in 2022. The metaphor for gumbo for today is therefore much different than the metaphor of a melting pot of yesteryear. Let me tell you why. When you look at a pot of gumbo, you can see the individuality of the shrimp. You can see the individuality of the sausage, and you can see the individuality of the okra. You can see the individuality of the chicken, or some people prefer hen because of its consistency. But you can see the individuality of all of those individual ingredients. They come together not losing their individuality, but they come together complementing one another, making something that is rich and diverse, that's a community. America is supposed to be about richly diverse groups of people coming together in the concept of community without losing the authenticity of their individuality. Meaning, whether you identify as black or as white, whether you identify as straight or as gay, whether you are side gender or transgender, whether you're Jewish or Catholic, maybe you're of Hispanic ancestry, maybe you're of Irish ancestry, maybe you're of African ancestry. That's why gumbo is my favorite food. And that's why I want to see gumbo served in my neighborhood. But that begs the question, where do I live? In other words, who are my neighbors? Now with a nod to the rich heritage of this wonderful institution, this place of higher learning called Mars Hill University, you can't call the name Mars Hill without reflecting on the Apostle Paul. 
and the message of the true God he gave, as recorded in Luke, excuse me, as recorded by Luke in Acts 17, when Paul shares a message really about reconciliation and speaking to Jews and Gentiles and speaking to men and speaking to women. And therefore, thinking about this university's Christian heritage to highlight the importance of diversity in a neighborhood where people eat gumbo, I thought I would pose the question to you, and who is your neighbor? Luke, the author who wrote about Paul at Mars Hill in the book of Acts, is the same Luke who wrote the gospel that bears his name. In the 10th chapter of Luke, verses 25 through 37, he tells the story of how Jesus asked the question, about neighbors. One of the Bible's most popular passages, uh, uh, Jesus shares the parable of the Good Samaritan, where in the New Revised Standard Version, you find these words. Just then, Mr. President, a lawyer stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He said to them, what is written in the law? What do you read there? He answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, You have given the right answer. Do this and you will live. But wanting to justify himself, this lawyer as Jesus. And who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers who stripped him, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. Now, by chance, a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed on the other side. But a Samaritan, while traveling, came near him, and when he saw him, he was moved with pity. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, having poured oil and wine on them. Then he put him on his own animal brought him to an inn and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper and said, take care of him and when I come back I will repay you whatever more you spend. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? He said, the one who showed him mercy. Jesus said to him, Go and do likewise. Now, as I initially reflect on Luke's text, it takes me back to New Orleans, probably because that's where I had my initial conceptualization of what I call a neighborhood. Let me call the road. In New Orleans, you hear names like Algiers and the Irish Channel. You hear names like the Garden District and, of course, Treme. And there's the world-famous French Quarter. Now, because race has been significant as a social construct in the history of America and as someone who came of age in the 1970s, only a few years after the Civil Rights Movement, I grew up in what could only be described as a black neighborhood. As I entered middle school, however, because of integration and because of the practical impact of Brown v. Board of Education, I had a chance to spend time with the proverbial other in other neighborhoods too. Meaning, I spent time with friends in white neighborhoods. I spent time with friends in Hispanic neighborhoods. I spent time with friends in upper class neighborhoods. And I also spent time with friends who were economically challenged in their neighborhoods as well. As I began to learn, I had a whole lot in common with a whole lot of people who were nothing like me. I also came to realize that I had to redefine my concept of a neighbor. Jesus, in this text, invites us to redefine our conceptualization of a neighbor and by extension of a neighborhood too. 
Now, Jesus could have very well answered the question directly. He chose not to. Instead, Jesus chose to flip the script. He chose to upset this lawyer's apple cart by asking him the same question he posed to Jesus. In doing so, Jesus introduces us to three characters who we come across, an, un an unnamed and an unidentified man who's been left for dead on the side of the road. More importantly, by framing this story as he does, Jesus gives us all a lesson about race relations long before the Black Lives Matter movement when we were introduced to names like Breonna Taylor and George Floyd. And let me lift up, yesterday was the second anniversary of the murder of Ahmaud Aubrey. This brother, beaten and left for dead on the side of the road, doesn't have a name. He doesn't have a background. We don't know anything about his education, and the text doesn't identify him by ethnicity or by race. But we can likely conclude he was a Jew, because Jesus was a Jew, surrounded by his Jewish disciples and answering the question of a Jewish lawyer, while also surrounded by Jewish people, we can conclude this brother was Jewish too. So in answering this lawyer's question from the perspective of a fellow Jew who was in a most precarious position and desperately in need of assistance, Jesus shows us that a real neighbor has less to do with where you live and more to do with your willingness to help somebody in their time of need. Jesus shows us that a real neighbor can be the proverbial other, someone you least expect. Meaning, your neighbor might be next door or your neighbor might be up the street. Your neighbor might be in another city or your neighbor might be in another state. Your neighbor might be black, your neighbor might be white. Your neighbor might be straight, your neighbor might be gay. Your neighbor might be male, your neighbor might be female. Your neighbor is the person when you're willing to look past your differences and find commonality, just like those diverse ingredients in a pot of gumbo, that person is your neighbor. First, Jesus begins by answering the lawyer's question as he introduces us to the first person, passerby, a priest. Now you would assume the priest would be the unnamed Jewish brother's neighbor because you'd assume that a priest would do good for others, not this priest. <laughs> this priest must have been concerned about doing good for himself. This priest must have been invited to preach at somebody's revival because he was in such a hurry, he beat feet to the other side and didn't even come in contact with this brother. Maybe this, pe this priest was beating feet and going to the other side to ensure there was no contact between him and this other brother who was left for dead because he didn't want anything to do with somebody he didn't know as a neighbor. Now. As Jesus continues answering the lawyer's question, the second passerby he introduces us to is the Levite. Surely, the Levite would be the neighbor. Levites are descendants of Levi. They are a holy people that have been set apart by God to do God's work in God's temple, including playing music for worship. Surely then the Levite, a holy person set apart by God, would stop to be a neighbor. Oops. He must have been late for revival too. The Levite did the same as the priest and he took off. Maybe as the priest had to preach, the Levite had to play the music. They must have both been late going to the same place because although they were the likely candidates, both of them went on with no contact with somebody who was in need, showing they could not be a neighbor. So the lawyer is still asking the question, who is my neighbor? Finally, in verse 33, Jesus says, but a Samaritan, while traveling, came near him, and when he saw him, he was moved with pity. Jesus then goes on to tell how the Samaritan cleaned up the injured Jew, bandaged up his wounds, and even made sure this Jew got the care he needed as he was on his way to recovery. This, what the text describes as pity, is what the lawyer recognizes as mercy. 
So in thinking about all of the lines of division and the differences we see, in America, and thinking about divisions between white evangelical Christians and more progressive social justice oriented Christians. Divisions between blacks and whites, divisions that have made the celebration of Black History Month so necessary in the first place, they're divisions we're facing today. Divisions based on Christian nationalists who are trying not only to destroy democracy and unwrite black history, but they're removing books from libraries, they're banning discussions on black history in public schools, and they don't want any references to the Jewish Holocaust. This part of the parable had to get everyone's attention because of the cultural differences and the well-known enmity between Samaritans and Jews. Surely they could not be neighbors. Samaritans were considered unclean by Jews, and Jews were the sworn enemy of Samaritans. Samaritans claim ethnic heritage from two of the 12 tribes of Israel, from the Levites and the Ephraimites. And because they were of mixed heritage, they were looked at as being different from everyone else in culture. In other words, they weren't Jews, but they certainly weren't Gentiles. Or to put it in the context of modern day America, they weren't black, but they most certainly were not white. So because of this racial and ethnic tension that existed between Jews and Samaritans and because of their long-standing animosity, there's no way you would think a Jew and a Samaritan could be neighbors. But this brother, this good Samaritan obviously was more interested in diversity, equity, and inclusion as well as racial reconciliation as he rejected an impulse of unconscious bias. This brother was apparently a forward-thinking Samaritan who was not so concerned about the things that divide us. He was much more concerned about the things that unite us. As we see lines of division throughout these United States of America, especially here during the month of February where we observe Black History Month, we can all learn a little something from this text because we should all be more deliberate in trying to make contact with somebody else, the proverbial other, to determine if we are neighbors. I want to close by sharing in context of racial reconciliation as well as diversity, equity, and inclusion, something that is a fundamental part of me when I think about Black History Month and telling you about my neighborhood where we eat gumbo. It's important that we all learn how to make gumbo in 2022 because we can no longer all eat from a melting pot. Shrimp should be able to be shrimp. Sausage should be able to be sausage. Chicken should be able to be chicken and okra should be able to be okra. You don't have to be something you're not to try to fit in and belong. In a diverse America, we want you to bring your full and authentic self to the table for whoever you are. That's one of the things I love about my hometown of New Orleans. It's also what I love about this text because Jesus redefined our conceptualization of a neighbor and a neighborhood with the parable of the Good Samaritan. Thank you, my friends. It's an honor to share with you tonight. So if anybody in the audience has a question that they would like to, to pose to him, he, he's open here to discuss. So I'll give it back to the podium so you'll be able to address. And if anybody um, wants to ask something, just raise your hand and he'll call. Either I did a horrible job and fell on my face, 
or I answered all possible questions you can have, but I'm here and I'm happy to talk. Dr. Augustine, thank you for that. Can thank you, you, Mr. President. Can you hear me okay? Yes, sir, absolutely. We have young people in the crowd, and what advice will you have for this generation? Our generation has not done great with this, and the generation ahead of us has not done great with it. And it's up to these young people to take over the leadership of our, our country, our world. What advice do you have for young people? I am, um, I am deeply encouraged as I think about the younger generation. Uh, there is a such thing, I'm wearing multiple hats now as I'm thinking. I'm thinking as a law professor, I'm also thinking as a pastor. Um, in, in pastoral leadership, we identify something that's called prophetic leadership, or the mind of a pastor, you identify something that's called prophetic leadership. Uh, when, you, when you typically think about uh, the prophet, the priest, or the king, right, the prophet is the one uh, who speaks truth to power. Uh, the prophet is the one who in the 1950s and 1960s, Martin Luther King Jr., the primary exemplar, uh, was determined to speak truth to institutions of power, to speak up for uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion, what we would say now, but equality uh, for all individuals. So that's the, that's the role of the prophet. Uh, some people say that we arrived, and, uh, and we became, we meaning those that would give a prophetic voice, uh, uh, we, we became complacent. Some people say the church, with the import of its prophetic witness, fell asleep. Uh, and that we were more interested in going to, to praise parties than we were in going to protest marches to make sure we continued speaking truth to power. I think the narrative of make America great again woke everybody up. I think uh, I'm, not, I'm not calling out any particular politician. I'm not calling out any, any partisan party. I'm talking about a narrative uh, that, would, that would vilify Mexican immigrants, a narrative that would lock people up in cages and separate young people from their families, um, uh, a narrative that would call people rapists, murderers, and so forth, so on, based on ethnicity, a narrative that would suggest that immigrants from one country or a set of countries opposed to others come from you know what whole countries, s whole countries. That sort of stuff, I think, woke America up. And, and when I look at the protest marches of 2020 and contrast them to the protest marches of the 1960s, demographics alone show that this young generation woke up and spoke up and was deeply engaged in caring about America caring about what democracy really is in America. It's not supposed to be a pipe dream. It's something we get up and work for every day. So it, it, it took the pressure of oppression. It took the, it took the pressure of discomfort. But I am, I am deeply encouraged by what I saw in terms of uh, multi-generational engagement, uh, in terms of what I saw about multi-racial and multi-ethnic engagement. Uh, I'm very encouraged by what I have seen from young people. I just don't want us to, to go to sleep anymore. I want us to remain awake. I want us to run for office. I want us to speak out on issues on behalf of communities. I want you to take advantage of the foundation of a wonderful institution like Mars Hill because this is a place where you are, you are immersed in a moral narrative that should send you forward to a biblically based moral narrative that should send you forward to do great things in leadership in the community. So don't become complacent just because you know everything seems okay. Um, uh, because I because I talk on my iPhone, because I, I look at my iPad, and because email me at me.com. No, it's not just about you, right? It's about the larger space of, of, of making sure democracy uh, is something that we fight for every day. So I, I, Mr. President, I actually am very encouraged by young people. I just hope we remain encouraged, and I hope it does not take uh, oppression again, political oppression, to, uh, to, to, to make us engage. But I'm very encouraged by what I'm seeing in young people. If there's any advice I would give you, uh, uh, remain engaged. Remain engaged, uh, uh, seek public office. Go to law school, go, go get a PhD, go, go to a place, teach elementary school, teach middle school, be in a place where you can help influence society is what I'm trying to say. Does that make sense? I hope that's responsive. Yes, sir, and, and would you also explain to them how important it is to get your degree, to take advantage of this moment, where you have the opportunity to leave here with a college degree. Would you 
tell, talk, speak to the importance of that in your life? My goodness gracious. Um, you know, in my, I'm, I turned 50 in November, so I guess I'm old, right? I'm old now. Um, uh, but I can remember growing up in the 70s and in my parents' generation, my father worked as a, uh, as a, as a postal superintendent. He worked his way up from, from a letter carrier to become a superintendent in the, uh, in the post office. Uh, uh, he did not have a college degree, uh, and he had to work a whole lot of overtime, a whole lot of overtime, a whole lot of overtime to, to, to do the things that he wanted to do to support his family. Uh, my mother did have a college degree, and um, uh, she taught school. She taught for 37 years as a public school teacher in, uh, in Orleans Parish. Uh, we have parishes in city counties in Louisiana, uh, where I'm from. Um, and it's, it's interesting because my family would have been considered black middle class uh, back then. By my mind, times have changed. Without a college degree now, there is, there is no way you can remotely be a part of, and when I say class, I don't, I don't mean that in a, in a pejorative sense based on you know, who wears a bow tie, who doesn't know how to tie a tie. I don't mean it in, that, in a social sense, I mean it in an economic sense. Um, in terms of your, your anticipated earnings, uh, in terms of the opportunities that are before you, you need at least, if it was Sunday, I would say somebody say at least. Okay, I know it's not Sunday, but thank you for saying at least. You need at least a bachelor's degree to be remotely competitive uh, 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 economically uh, in America these days. Uh, with, the, with the advent of technology, so many jobs that otherwise would have gone to quote unquote unskilled workers, unskilled laborers, uh, those jobs, there's no need for that because we've got a computer that does those things. So who is the person that programs the computer? Right? Who is the person that is, that is indispensable? That's somebody who has higher academic training. Um, there are certain, professional, certain professions, rather, going back to my comment of, of at least a, a degree, they're, they're, the president and I were talking a moment ago, our commonality, uh, uh, we, both, we both went to law school, right? We both practice law and don't miss a bit of that. I don't wanna go back to that, I don't wanna do, but it's a, it's a wonderful profession because you are able to help people. You are able to solve problems and engage in critical thinking that most people can't. You're able to watch the news at a level of perception and accuracy on things where most people are completely oblivious to what's going on. That makes you, in certain situations, indispensable, right? That's the kind of academic training I'm making reference to. It also gives you an opportunity. I'm big on service and I'm big on giving back to others. If, if there's any foundational scripture that really molds my life, it is to he who much is given, much will be required. Um, uh, so I'm big on giving back to others because I think so much has been given to me. I've got a responsibility to be in the space to give back to others. I would encourage you, I'm probably tying this back into the first part of the question. I would encourage you to seek out professions uh, uh, that, that nine out of 10 of them, if you're gonna be economically viable, will require, again, at least a college degree but seek out professions where you're in a space to help mold others and give to others. Because if you really think about what you're receiving here at Mars Hill, I've, I've read enough, I've walked around enough, I've seen enough, so much is being given to you right now, it's incredible. Like, I mean, you are in a wonderfully rich space that has so much potential. I just hope you take advantage of it and give back to others the same way so much has been given to you. socially miserable because as an African-American who grew up in the South and in the inner city, that's not, I mean, I, I saw myself as becoming a lawyer to become a champion of the people, to become a real, you know, and that's not the space I was in and I became terribly unhappy. Um, um, I was able to do some good pro bono. I was able to do some good for others in extra time, but, but practicing law for me in the space I was in was, um, was really not fulfilling for what I wanted, right? So I, I sought to find commonality by helping people. Um, um, I went to, I accepted the call to ministry. 
Uh, I went to seminary, but I still had to, I had to support myself. I still had to keep food on the table, as they say. I wasn't in the space, I had loans from law school, I wasn't in the space to take out a second set of graduate school loans. Uh, 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 the, if the Lord calls you to it, they say the Lord will bring you through it, right? So um, I was blessed, uh, but I worked as a public defender during my time in, um, in seminary. Um, um, and I realized, my goodness gracious, the, the disparities of, of race, the disparities of class, the disparities of economic means in America, especially in the criminal justice system, I was like, wow. So, I was so glad that I was someone who had the skill set of having been a partner in a multi-state law firm and I could do what I did, and I was so glad to be able to apply that in the space of a public defender to be able to do what I did then to help people to try to find commonality and best results in a system that I knew was inherently unfair in many regards, but I had to do the best for my clients in that system. You take that person who then enters pastoral ministry and all of a sudden now, you know, as they say, when the doors of the church are open, they're open. Let whosoever come in, my goodness gracious, when you start really working with people and not in the ivory tower of a law firm, not in the closed off space, you start learning, my goodness gracious, there are some major divisions in society. And you have to ask the question, what will I do to try to solve them? What will I do to try to bring people together? Uh, for me, that took the place of running for and holding public office in Louisiana and trying to do good for folks. Um, it, took the, it took the role of, of uh, uh, you know, somebody who was deeply committed to, to political equality, of making sure the Voting Rights Act said what it said, it means what it means. Um, um, it took the role as a minister then of pursuing social justice, what we would call social justice for others. And over the last four or five years, it has really taken a space in my mind of reconciliation. Because that is the, um, um, that is the, I want to say thank you. The university was kind enough to, to purchase uh, 60 some my books, I think 60 books. I recently had a book published on reconciliation. Uh, the title is Called to Reconciliation, How the Church Can Model Justice, Diversity, and Inclusion. And it speaks about all of the systemic differences that we have had in society and it speaks about ways not just from a Christocentric lens but from a social lens how we can bridge those gaps and prayerfully bring people together because if all means all then we hold these truths to be self-evident that all people are created equal right um, so so reconciliation for me is something that is is deeply important in terms of trying to bring people together that speaks directly to the narrative of divisions that we have in the United States of America. Because I am who I am, I'm not afraid, I asked, how far can I go with the envelope? How far can I push it? He said, push the envelope. I said, okay. So I'm not afraid to talk about politics because those divisions are real. You see Stop the Steal on television. You see people saying we had a free and fair election. You see folks doing an insurrection at the White House. Oh, at the, at the U.S. Capitol, forgive me. Um, uh, we, we are, you cannot live in America and not recognize the deep divisions we have in America. So there's no sense in me coming in trying to sing, hey, trying to sing hey, a Yankee Noodle Dandy and be happy about everything. It's a time, especially on a college campus, to be real, to be authentic, and to be like the shrimp, to be a shrimp, to be like the sausage, to be the sausage, to be who I am and let you know how I feel. So divisions are deep in America and I don't want to run from divisions. I want to talk about them because that's the only way we can, can hopefully bring folks together. Does that make sense in response to your question? I have, um, I have, if you, if you, you know, I saw something on the news this morning, uh, uh, a gentleman, I forget the society he was representing, but the point of the story was, it was on Spectrum News. The point of the story was that North Carolina is still a very rural place, notwithstanding the population gains we've had in very urban areas. I will admit that the 90% of my time is in more urban areas. And in urban areas, I can, I, you can trust and believe folks are stepping out like, like, I mean, my goodness gracious, right? So I will admit I have not spent as much time, it's been more isolated in, a, in, in rural spaces. Uh, but what I am so concerned about is more than anything else, 
the attempt, I, I glossed over it, maybe perhaps I was trying to be cute or entertaining because I assume the references are there, right, to, to uh, or their common knowledge, but maybe they're not common knowledge, right? So when you, when you try to excise from the gumbo an essential ingredient, when you try to take the sausage out of the gumbo, when you try to take the okra out of the gumbo, when you try to take black history out of America, you cannot, you cannot tell the story of black history and say that everything has been the same, it's been equal at all times. You can't say that story because it, it, it diminishes the significance of the celebration. The celebration is such because African Americans have overcome so much going back to 1619, not July 4th, 1776, 1619. That is what makes the narrative so very special. I'm concerned now because there is a movement afront, which I believe is a dangerous movement because it has, a, it has potential to really kill democracy. And that movement is Christian nationalism. It is, it is an attempt to wrap the cross of Christ in the American flag and to say, if you are not part of this original narrative, you don't belong. That is dangerous. And as part of trying to, to, to make sure your generation is not aware of certain things, um, when you talk about, uh, you know, diminishing academic freedom on college campuses and start saying that, you know, tenured professors at public universities, tenured professors, if you teach, quote unquote, critical race theory, you know, we'll bring you up for, uh, what? Are you kidding me? Right? Uh, when, it's, when it's used as a wedge issue, can I just tell you, can I be honest with you? I, I studied critical race theory in law school. In law school. I'm going to say it again, in law school. It is not something, it is not something, I'm gonna say it a third time, it is not something that is being taught in elementary school, in middle schools, in high schools. The subject matter is far too complex. It is a lens through which we look at social movements in America, um, uh, and a lens no different than my iPhone has a lens and a camera, there's a camera recording, so that's a lens, it's a way to look at certain things um, that is not being used in elementary schools. But we have reached a dangerous space when we want to drop a wedge issue and people say, well, I'm going to pull my children out of school because I don't want them going to school with them. Who is them? <laughs> We've reached a dangerous space where for your generation, if we remove books from the library on the Holocaust, all of a sudden we have no cultural significance of what our Jewish brothers and sisters have been through in America. That's dangerous. That's very, very dangerous. So from what I'm seeing, again, in the, in the primarily... Uh, uh, urban areas where I'm operating, I'm seeing people who are deeply engaged, who are deeply aware, who are showing, I mean, it's like it's the 1960s again. Folks are like, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be heard. I'm gonna, the First Amendment means something, I'm gonna speak out, I'm gonna be heard. I just wanna make sure your generation has access to the same knowledge so you can make choices just like previous generations. Does that make sense? Yes, ma'am. So what do we do as college students right now to work towards a better America? So um, I, would, I would say, first of all, you have to be aware of the problems in America, right? There, there are statistics which show there is a, um, there's a, there's a watering down effect of America. We're getting news from uh, talk shows opposed to getting news from news sources. There is a, uh, there's a danger also that news has become entertaining now. Uh, there's big business in news. It, it literally is big business. Um, uh, there's an old expression that says, if it leads, it bleeds, right? So they're always going to give you the worst stuff up front to get you to, you know, get you to tune in. And, and people, people, there are uh, 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 algorithms that, that show how news from Fox is programmed, to, is, 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 is designed to hit a certain demographic, just like news from CNN is designed to hit a certain demographic. But we need to, perhaps we need to read, right? Like if we read the New York Times, if we read the local papers, read USA Today, then we can filter information ourselves. So I would, I would encourage, number one, to be aware of what's going on. Don't just put your head in the sand, I'm in college. Well, so what, right? Um, um, college is the time to immerse yourself. When you're in school, it's the time to really immerse yourself in what's going on. Let me very briefly, I'm gonna come back to the question and I'm not gonna give you a long road in a small house, but I wanna give you two examples of how I was attuned to something and when I was in an academic laboratory, the way I experienced it just like enhanced it to a, a way I just can't, can't begin to describe. I was in law school from 1998 
to 2001, to Tulane University Law School down in my hometown of New Orleans. I can remember the semester I studied constitutional law. Keith Werhan, Lord have mercy, one of the best constitutional law scholars you ever want to meet. Keith, Professor Keith Werhan, the semester I had Keith Werhan's class was the semester, watch this, William Jefferson Clinton was impeached. And my God, to go to school and to have read all of the stuff and to sit there and look at Professor Werhan, and he was he was like a like a an instigator, a little agitator. Warhan was not so much, watch this, he was not so much of a teacher, he was more of a facilitator, because at that level, everybody's read what they're supposed to read when they come to class. He would ask a question in the abstract, turn his head, people would be like, why'd he ask that? He'd ask something else, where's he going with this? All of a sudden, he'd ask the third question, and boom, 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 stuff would come together. What do you think about that, Jay? What do you think about that, boom, boom, boom? It was amazing to be in an academic laboratory while what was going on in the world was being discussed with one of the best minds. I was, I was, I mean, blown away. Does that make sense? Let me give you another example. Fast forward several years, I went to seminary, of course. Um, um, you know, I took a class, a, the, the, uh, the study of Christianity is divided, the history of Christianity, at least is divided in the curriculum there. There's the history of Christianity part one, the history of Christianity part two. You start from the apostolic era and you work your way up probably to the Reformation. You go from Reformation to the 1960s, 1970s, what have you, particularly with the stuff in America and the role religion has played, right? I can remember the person who taught me, this must have been History of Christianity 1, uh, yes, because I remember all of the other books. So anyway, Dr. David Whitford, we took an intercultural trip after having studied so much and so much formative stuff, we took an intercultural trip to Italy and I was in the Sistine Chapel with Dr. Whitford, and I was just like, are you kidding me? And to be right there with him at the place where on this rock I will build my church, I was like, you have got to be kidding me. Phenomenal. The point I'm trying to illustrate is, you can only have that level of perception, that level of cerebral appreciation, if you're really in tune to what's going on. So the first thing I would say is to become really attuned to what's happening in the world. The second thing I would say is your generation is, is, is different. You're being exposed to more by virtue of the internet, so I think you are going to have less, I can't say any other word but this, less prejudice about yourself, and I mean prejudice in a multi, multifaceted context. You're going to have less in terms of racial prejudice. You're going to have less in terms of gender prejudice. You're going to have less in terms of prejudice because people uh, have a different sexual orientation in you. So xenophobia across the board is being watered down just because of your social exposure. Things that are on TV now, are just random on TV now, there's no way in the 1970s when I was growing up, there is no way that stuff would've been on television. It's a different world now, right? So because you all are gonna be more, are gonna, are gonna receive what equality is supposed to be much more quickly than perhaps a generation ago would have, when somebody tries to come in the way and destroy a notion of equality, you ought to be ready to stand up for that. If you, and I was, I was eating over, what's the place where we were eating? Huh? Pitman. Pitman. I ate in Pitman and the food was good. I want you, Mr. President, you have some good cooks. So yes, you do have good cooks in Pitman. Yes, you do. We ate in Pitman and I was just looking at all of the flags and I said, people from, oh, is that right? Okay, wonderful, wonderful. And we talked about the, the possibility to talk. They want to put the prison flag up. I say, okay, okay, I'm feeling it. I'm, I'm taking it all in. I'm just taking it all in, right? But the point is, if you are in a community, here's the gumbo, if you are in a community that is rich and diverse and you have friends from Mexico, for example, once you break down barriers. When I was in law school, I had so many Jewish friends. I learned so many things about Judaism that I otherwise would not have known. Um, uh, uh, but when you are willing to break down the barriers based on your social experience, and then all of a sudden somebody comes, I'm going back in time, somebody says, Mexicans are rapists and drug dealers and murderers, and we're gonna use it, hey, wait a minute, wait, 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 wait. That's wholly inconsistent with what I know from this person I hang out with all the time. That's like, so what I'm saying is, by way of social experience, your generation is gonna be a little different from generations past, because you're in, you're in the gumbo. You're in the gumbo. So when something strikes your moral core as wrong, be informed and speak out. Does that make sense? John Lewis, I had on a shirt yesterday, um, uh, 
uh, Maud, I forget what it said, but it was a, it was a nine to Maud Aubrey, uh, 2.23 to run your 2.23 miles. I didn't run yesterday, unfortunately, but I did wear a t-shirt, right? Y'all supposed to laugh at that. Somebody's supposed to laugh. Anyway, okay, but I did wear a t-shirt, but on the back of the t-shirt, there was a quote from John Lewis, the, 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 the Congressman John Lewis, uh, uh, who of course was, was you know, sacrificed his body on, on March the 7th, 1965 at the Edmund Pettus Bridge, had his skull cracked in literally as he was trying to march for the right to vote, right? But the quote on the back of the shirt, in so many words, was a long quote, but uh, uh, if you see something, say something, right? And that's, that's your generation. If you see something, don't just become so, oh, I'm on my iPhone, all is cool, all is well, all is well. Is my internet service okay? No, it's got to be more than about your individual internet service. It's got to be about the community to which you belong. It's got to be about the gumbo and making sure everybody has a space of belonging. Does that make sense? Absolutely, thank you. Absolutely, thank you for the question. Thank you for the question. Yes, I'm sorry, yes. How much of a role do you think guilt plays in people not wanting their kids to learn about uh, Wait, I'm sorry, say again, please. How much of a role do you think guilt plays in people not wanting their kids to learn about critical race theory? Um, so, I, I, some of it perhaps is guilt, some of it perhaps, I don't say this word to be pejorative or to be mean, it's just, it is what it is. Ignorance, some of it is ignorance. And let me distinguish, let me qualify my use of the term ignorant, right? Uh, my mother used to tell me as a child, she said, son, there's nothing wrong with being ignorant, because ignorant means you just don't know. Once somebody shows you something, then you are no longer ignorant to it, because now you know. There's a difference between ignorance and stupid, because stupid is when you know and you choose to act like you're ignorant, and that's stupid. But, but some people are just ignorant to certain things, they just don't know, so by nature, they are afraid of it, because that's, that's way, that's different, right? And that's what xenophobia is, when we have fear of people who are not like us, we, we, that's, that's the definition of xenophobia. But so some of it may very well be um, you know, a guilt, well, I, don't want, I don't want people to know what our ancestors did, but how can, you, how, can you not, how can you live in America and not have a real appreciation for the social construct of race and what it has meant, right? Um, there's no way you can have a fundamental appreciation for demographics and just to look at, I mean, if you're gonna be an informed citizen, you have to know your country, and you can't have a diluted history. That's, that's a disservice. You should be able to learn history, not his story, right? You should be able to learn history and dissect for yourself what it is. Uh, if, you, if you talk about you know, a certain lens, I go back to critical race theory as a lens. It's not the information itself, it's a lens through which you perceive the information. If, if, if some professors are sharing information with a lens that is more tilted than others, uh, if they say that's academic freedom, perhaps it's academic freedom, right? But um, the goal, I think, of a professor when, you, when, you're, when you're introducing topics, and let's just use history in the context of what it is, what I can share with you with my students in class when we do problems, you know, law problems, law case studies, what have you, um, I'm, I'm always trying to be a facilitator, and I will ask pointed questions because probably because I admire Keith Warhan so much, I try to act like that, that Keith Warhan did. What do you think about that? Why do you think that was? What does that tell you? What year was this case decided? What was going on in the United States at that time, right? So when you start to ask the probing questions and you really get into the narrative, it's hard not to recognize America has an incredible history, and I don't necessarily mean that in the best way, right? We've got some darker demons that I hoped, past tense, were, were, were gone. Uh, but again, I referenced the Make America Great Again narrative, it woke so much stuff up. So I question where we are as a country right now. That means we need people to be deliberate to talk about healing to talk about bringing folks together and to talk about my narrative, reconciliation, right? But here's the thing, you can't talk about reconciliation until you have reckoning, until you, you, you own up for the past, until you have a, a, a true session, truth session. In South Africa, after, after the evil institution of apartheid, which was the equivalent of Jim Crow in the South, right? Um, uh, the commission that was formed, that, uh, that Nelson Mandela appointed Desmond Tutu to chair, was not just called a Reconciliation Commission, it was called the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. So the point I'm trying to say is that, going back to your question, is we've got to, we've got to recognize who we are, what we've been, that helps us become better. 
Because if I recognize I made a mistake, I can grow from that. Opposed to, you know, I just want to gloss over it and just give you a happy story. That's, that's, that's what I was referencing in the, in the, in the remarks about the, the watered down, taking the spices out. That's not, that does, that's a disservice to all. Does that answer your question? Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. Let me give a shameless plug for my book. <laughs> all right. Um, called To Reconciliation. How the Church Can Model Justice, Diversity, and Inclusion. My given name is actually Jonathan. I go by Jay because that's probably much cooler than Jonathan, right? Um, uh, but, but Jonathan, J-O-N-A-T-H-A-N, middle initial C, Augustine. Or if you just Google J. Augustine, I promise you it'll come up. I promise you it'll come up. I promise you it'll come up. But anyway, uh, uh, J. Augustine, it's a, it's a, I think it's a good book. Would you think? He's like, I'm not going to embarrass you in front of your friends and tell you it's not a good book. Yes, it's a good book. It is. I think it really is. But I really, really think an institution like this that is, that is rooted in the, in the moral narrative of the church that is obviously based on everything I've seen, making amends for the past, uh, uh, Joe Anderson, the people, I mean, I'm, I'm really, I'm taking it all in here at Mars Hill. I appreciate your comments about, you know, he saw us out, he said, I'm really taking it all in. And, uh, and, and Mr. President, this is a, a wonderful institution you have. You all know this is a wonderful institution. Is it perfect in terms of its past? Absolutely not, because America is not perfect in terms of her past. But, but reconciliation is a two-sided coin. One side says that the dominant class or the class that has been doing the subjugating makes amends and they say we are going to be deliberate in doing some things differently. And the other side that has been subjugated has got to be able to say and forgiveness has got to be a part of this equation for us to move forward. Right? So, so let, me, let me encourage you, ask you please, it's available wherever books are sold, Call to Reconciliation. How the church can model justice, diversity, and inclusion, and it is very, very interdisciplinary. It's not just church stuff, it's civil rights stuff, it's Black Lives Matter stuff, it's all the stuff that we talked about tonight in different terminology maybe, but, but all of the stuff we talked about tonight. Baker Academic is the publisher, and I hope you'll pick up a copy. Thank you all so very much. And thank you, Dr. Augustine, for that challenging word. A couple of things I will send out in the announcements. Again, information about the book, but if you're interested, you can come down to um, the Center for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion down there in Renfro. I do have some copies that I'm willing to give away, and um, I have some that I'm also willing to give to the library, so we do have some already available if you're interested in continuing this message, which really is a challenge as you look around and you look at yourself. What we're being challenged to do to deal with this and to look and move our community forward is to engage. Not just to be here, but to actually engage, to be active. Not just to come to an event, but now take what you've heard from the event back to where you go and discuss it. Pro, what did I learn from the event? Where do we go from here? And challenge others who may not have been at the event or were at the event. These are things that we need to do to move forward. So I think the message, as Dr. Augustine has said, looking at the story of the Good Samaritan, he was willing to engage. He was willing to be active and not just rely on somebody else to do it. And that's a call for all of us. Thank you for giving your time and energy to come out this evening. We really appreciate it. And this is just one step as we move forward down this journey becoming a more empowering community together. I hope you have a good evening. And if you need a pause credit, you didn't get it when you came in, make sure that you um, see one of us up at the top so that we can log in so you'll get your pause credit. You have a good evening.